Welcome hey, to hey. Talk. Oh, wow. What does that say? Hey, fellas. It's an add to cart kind of day. This is actually what <laughs> what uh, Todd's wife gave gave uh, my wife for Christmas. Oh, really? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a mutual there's a shopping interest, mutual interest, a shopping yeah. component going on there. I I can imagine. The, Definitely uh, Amazon. Uh, yeah, I exactly. Know. How's everybody doing? Great. Great. How are you? Fantastic, man. Yeah, you know. Doing, what's the uh, weather doing... like in Winnipeg uh, this time? Oh, that's always geez. that's always the go to every time is what's the <laughs> it's, weather like it's, in Winnipeg. It's going to be it's even more of a funny story this week because in the last couple of days and in the next couple of days I think Winnipeg will experience all four seasons in four <laughs> days. Yesterday, wow. no, no word of a lie. You won't you won't even believe this and uh if you didn't see it you'd think I was making it up. But this was an actual shot from the weather station yesterday. And you'll see here where it says, I don't know if you can see that. 19. What? 19, but look at the top. Blowing snow advisory. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? So that's yeah. that's in metric, that everybody, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, right, well, so 19 is like 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Correct. Super warm. But, but and, also with a blowing snow advisory. So. How do you get that at the same time? Well, Isn't because that called now, rain? Now there's snow outside. <laughs> Yesterday That's we were barbecuing insane. at 19 and now there's snow. So tomorrow's supposed to be like wind gusts and rain. And then I guess maybe wow. we'll, sometime we'll see spring. So yeah, That's Winnipeg knows? for you, though. We all know that in the prairies. It can it can bounce. It's it's like it's nice today, but there is a significant chance that there will be blowing snow. So, well, you know what they say, <laughs> just, if you don't like the weather, just, just wait an hour. You know, exactly. Yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. There's no way to prepare at all. You can't, you know, that's no. uh, the thing, you know, so just everybody's kind of dusting off their, their deck and putting away all their snow shovels and then all of a sudden pulling them back out again. So, you know, yeah, don't get too excited to take your snow tires off just yet. Exactly. You know, the joke, right? Why is it so windy in Saskatchewan? Because Manitoba know. sucks and Alberta blows. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy oh boy yeah, that's fighting some... words today <laughs> we got an alberta guy and a, a winnipeg right. guy right there yeah but that's my great, mulberry tree love, is starting to bud what's, what's that, that my, my mulberry tree is actually starting to bud today wow nice. yeah shoots up these like buds and then they fall everywhere and then the tree just explodes into this canopy of leaves do you get wow. mulberry berries? No, it's it's a male, so it doesn't have the uh, berries. Doesn't have the berry. Well, I thought males have berries. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you don't I, want I just learned that there's this male tree, and female trees. This tree, I, this tree must identify as a, as a different uh, species, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> I didn't even know that there were male and female trees. I didn't know that either. That's a delicate yeah, subject. Are, Let's move right. on. And I would have assumed <laughs> that the mulberry bush would be the female. Is that not the thing? <laughs> and <laughs> see. I really like mulberries. <laughs> <laughs> mulberries are delicious. Uh, yeah. There we go. They, they make a huge mess if you have a female mul mulberry. Right? Yeah. For those that don't know, Corey knows exactly what to eat on the ground, out of trees. Uh, if you're ever like lost in nature, which I most assuredly never will be, but if it ever happened, I hope to be lost with Corey. I have to show you my garden because I actually have cabbage growing, carrots, um, Swiss chard, and then I have two sections for my wild weeds that are actually edible. Well, edible weeds, in particular, chickweed is what I'm growing right now, and it wow. and you just cut it off; it grows like a weed. <laughs> Imagine that, literally. And I put it in my green smoothies. Delicious. Wow, it's hilarious when we go. We go, we'll go hiking together and he'll be pointing at every, oh yeah, this leaf you can eat. And this one's called a blah, 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 blah. And <laughs> I, it's uncanny how much information he knows about yeah, edible I'm, leaves and plants. I'm the most, most annoying hiking partner you'll ever have. And birds. <laughs> and, and birds. Oh, I'll, no, I'll, I'll point it all out. Yeah, I saw what was, that, what was that movie, that one guy that uh, went to go live on his own in the wilderness there and. Uh, they made into a movie the about him. No, yeah, into, into the wild. wild. Yeah, exactly. Wild, wild, maybe wild. I don't know. Yeah, there was. Uh, you know. So yeah, you you would be a good ha you know help to have around. Uh, I sure. don't think that ended in his favor. So I don't know. No, because he didn't really... have Corey with him, right? I mean, he. Yeah, that, yeah that's Corey. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Did he yeah. Not die by eating some berry that he wasn't supposed to? Or something? Yeah. Well, he actually died from um, a bacteria that that was keeping his keeping him from from digesting his food so he couldn't get any he was eating stuff but it wasn't uh 
assimilating into his system and that he died of starvation basically oh yeah yeah well, you, know what, what, you know what that's, you know what, that's not going to happen that's not going to happen in my house so i'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> well, if covid keeps going much longer you yeah, true. Might get pretty empty yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll have to start growing stuff in my garden. Well, I'll, luckily my wife's pretty handy. Just grow weeds, man. They don't grow take any, weeds. any care at all. I'll just start eating things mm -hmm. and whichever things make me feel terrible, I'll be like, well, don't eat those anymore, which I suppose is the way it worked back in the day. <laughs> Jerry died. Don't eat those ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you know what they say, just eat whatever your body will tend to reject it if it's not supposed to be there. So, you know, that's true. <laughs> or it'll show you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like, like 48 ovs don't don't drink that many ovs your your body will tell you <laughs> oh, well, yes. you know i don't know there's uh, some people up here that would probably disagree with you you know <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's true 40 that's ovs true. that's lunch you know. <laughs> yeah ov what does that still have ov old vienna old vienna. Yeah. vienna that's a that's a yeah. is it a canadian beer technically yeah, there was well, it there was always the old slang, but I mean, we'll let people interpret their own version. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. I don't remember. Old Gimli didn't go so well, so they had to call it Old Vienna to raise old sales. Old Vienna, there you go. <laughs> old Gimli. <laughs> old Gimli. <laughs> well, you know, Gimli, home of Crown Royal, right? That's true. Exactly. Actually, that is true. But they didn't call it Crown Gimli, did they? That's true. That's true. No, they didn't. No, not didn't. quite as uh, not quite as effective. Oh, I think yeah. Shane's frozen. We lost Shane. <laughs> <laughs> or he's just really he's hungry he's biting his lip <laughs> he's really yeah he's that's really a into great it shot. <laughs> yeah that's a great still i shouldn't laugh mine's gonna freeze here and there too you're pretty good today we're, oh, gonna, that's uh, good. we're gonna wait to uh get shane back and then we'll bring on our guest here so we're doing well i mean we're, we're five minutes in and we've got every emoji across the board there you go <laughs> hey now it's three. Oh, uh, that's we better now, yeah, that's better. It feels better. Yeah. It's more like uh, the Bee Gees or Rush. <laughs> Those are my references for three pieces. The Bee Gees <laughs> and Rush. Yeah. There we go. Hey! hey there he is. Malfunction. Well, well, that's all right. All right. Well, function, junction. Welcome to the internet. Who's on today? Yeah, yeah. who's on today? today? Today, I'm very excited to have this guy on today. Uh, I have so many stories about watching and playing with these guys in one fashion or another, or, well, in a couple of his different acts, but uh, yeah, he is a, an amazing guitar player, a very innovative guitar player. And actually, I was looking at some rig stuff today, and 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 really, he's flying the Canadian flag high on his on his on his rig. So a lot of that I want to talk about as well. Uh, he's an amazing producer. He's uh, he's really far reaching. He ended up in the states uh, in that whole Austin scene. Austin, of course, you know Steve Ray Vaughan. Um, the Archangels guys like Charlie Drayton and I mean, uh, Charlie Sexton and Doyle Bramble and all those guys come out of that area. So it's a really cool scene down there. So he's uh, it's been around, you know, since back in the day and uh, always been an amazing dude. Always been amazing to me from one of my favorite all time Canadian groups. Ladies and gentlemen, please make some noise from Big Sugar, Gordy Johnson. Hey, hey, hey. How was that for an intro? And I didn't even rehearse that. Me. <laughs> yes yeah yeah insert name here uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. god reads that same script every week just yeah, yeah that's not name. true <laughs> that's not true at all not true <laughs> how are you good sir i'm doing all right man uh, we were chatting before the show here that we're still feeling the effects of that winter storm texas doesn't get winter storms so uh the fact that we had a week of freezing weather very Canadian of us, by the way, just to spend most of the time <laughs> talking about weather. I, yeah, exactly. you know, I left 20 years ago to escape it, and it followed me down here. So mm -hmm, a month later, I still have no drinking water. I know. That's oh, so wow. crazy. So is there even con uh, conversations about snow tires in places like Texas? That's not a thing, is it? It's not even a thing. You know, you know what they call hockey here? Uh, what? Ice hockey? Ice hockey. That's yeah, right. I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. I call I, it ice hockey because you got to specify. For yeah, right. What like other what kind a, of hockey? That's Field exactly. hockey's not that popular. That's exactly. That street exactly. hockey. No one's ever played yeah. road hockey here. Yeah, no. Unless it's, it's not a bunch a of Canadians sport. at South by Southwest, then <laughs> the net you know. set up. Outside. Could you imagine a televised game of road hockey? I think that might catch on. Actually, <laughs> it would. watch car. I miss you know, road <laughs> hockey, man. Car and then one of the sponsors drives hockey. through, you know, Chevrolet <laughs> yeah, is a sponsor yeah, yeah. of road hockey. <laughs> yeah, car. Yeah, exactly. Through. Game on, and then you go back. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, that's crazy. awesome. Are you in the uh, the sound the sound shack? What do you call that place? 
the sound shack live yeah. and direct from the sound shack yeah man i'm just uh making records in the middle of the day that's kind of what i do every day i've been uh i got a calendar full of projects uh the covid lockdown has had me really super busy actually amazing and not leaving home which i've got to be honest after that's a couple cool. of decades of tour 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 i'm kind of good with it absolutely no complaints uh, you're one of those lucky guys that you know everything kind of heated up when things got quiet that's good to hear well we had to make our own stuff too you know uh, not being able to tour actually putting out a new record in march of 2020 Oh, perfect. Uh, right? <laughs> I know how to pick them. March of 2020, let's, I got a great idea. Let's put uh, on a record and go on. Yeah, hiatus. Stay, stay home. home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we uh, started making stuff and we built a studio. And I've got a couple of buildings out here. I put all these cabins and made a little enclave, a little studio production world. And it's we can cool. record outside here. It's, you know, the weather is nice most of the time. And yeah. I have enough space and enough wires that I can just set up outside and play. Um, we started doing the live stream thing quite early on. Of course, I have no band members here. So yeah. um, the live stream thing, I was I started by playing with the recorded tracks because my studio is right here. So I could just run the cables outside and be outside with my full, you know, 412s amps, cables, pedal board, <laughs> double neck guitars, rocking out loud with in-ears and listening to the album tracks. So let's like play along with the album tracks. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. But I don't have all of the albums and all of the tracks to all the albums. So then I started re-recording tracks from our old records. Hmm. I thought, well, since I'm going to do that anyway, I might as well film myself doing it. So I filmed myself playing the drums and I filmed myself playing the bass. And then I filmed myself playing guitar live to, and I started editing video because, well, who's going to do that for you during COVID? So I'm like, oh, I, mm -hmm. I could probably figure that out. It's like Pro Tools, right? And, right, you know, right. Just started editing video. Now I get called to edit video like as a gig. That's, I guess, wow. I'm, I'm editing a telethon this week, a virtual fundraiser for an animal shelter here in central Texas. So amazing. Uh, yeah. It's that's not cool. even rock and roll. I still, it's still fun to do, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, I, before I know it, I, I've got like three different series out on, on YouTube, like a year's worth of stuff. Um, I actually, since January kind of took a break making stuff for the internet and started producing a record again for a, for an artist from Quebec named Ricky Paquette. Um, mm. I started doing some songwriting for a project with Mark Howard and Ruthie Foster, and it's just been amazing to be able to just work from my from my own space. You know, I just between me and the house, I go up, make dinner, come back down, record some more stuff. You know, it's it's pretty pretty sweet little deal. You're literally living the dream. Basically, everything you dreamt about as like a you know a twelve year old that you're doing it. I had to amend the original dream though. But, <laughs> what was the what was the original dream? Well, the rocking out loud in public, you know. That's oh, yeah, yeah. True, yeah. Of you course, know, y'all yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I had to adjust little, that. I, I, I guess I, I should have read the, the text thread because I'm the only one wearing a tube top. How come no one's wearing a tube top? Like, I <laughs> put on a jacket when I was in the green room because none of you guys aren't wearing tube tops. Why is this called tube top? <laughs> what? Oh, no, no, no. Like, no, no, no. Too too like that whole Vegas, LA, <laughs> girls, girls, girls kind of thing. Uh, so you're yeah. saying yeah. Like that Shane was the only one who could pull it off. So we I yeah, I was say. It's all, it's a bunch of dudes. It's and, a yeah. sausage yeah. party called Tube Top. It's, it's when way I, off. See, when I left the house, my wife and daughter was like, Papa, what do you, what do you, I was like, look, look you, you get invited to a thing, you should at least, you know, this is what's, that's what's going on. I've never seen Todd in a Tube Top. I've been on tour with him, and yet I've, I've never actually seen him in a Tube Top. It seems unlikely. I want to it's see that. Shirt, no shirt. With Todd, it's like shirt or no shirt. Yeah. <laughs> There's think a good chance. Top, it's like the best of both worlds. There's I think Todd will yeah. probably rock the tube top, actually. There's a good chance I probably won't be rocking a tube top. Too much. It might be too much muffin top these days, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the best. I, I never even thought of that. Tube talk, 
tube top. I love it. It really kind of flows. <laughs> I, flows. I don't have my glasses on, and I just look at my <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, It does yeah. say tube top. Wait yeah, <laughs> you just agree to things and just say yes. Okay, just give me that the link. Explains what link on and boom. Explains why you look so disappointed when you log yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are the ugliest girls I've talked to in a long time. <laughs> you guys set me up, man. Yeah. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. No, I was going to ask you because you literally are in in a place where I assumed it reminds me of the of the of the Bob Dylan line, which I will paraphrase because I always screw it up. But it's something like, "I I'm I belong a long way from where I was born." Is 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 a paraphrase of of the of the idea, and the fact that all of us come from you know the frozen country, and we still all love it, and we still all spend a ton of time there. But finding your roots and, 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 and your music to me always felt like it sounds like it has always sounded like you came from Austin or hmm. Nashville or, you know, somewhere down south, uh, not necessarily Canadian. So um, where did that come from? Like, how how did you find when you got into music? Um, well, we may as well start with like picking up a guitar, all that kind of stuff. Like, how old were you when all that kind of came upon you? Well, you see, wasn't there. Do, Weren't you listening to April Wine like the rest of us? I mean, what? No, get this, man. <laughs> I didn't even know there was an April Wine till like the late 90s. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, because I married a girl from Red Deer, and she was talking about these Canadian bands like Trooper and April Wine and yeah. Harlequin. I was like, yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, no, well, well, roll, go, go back there a second. What, do you, what was that again? What'd you say? <laughs> Harlequin, what? Harlequin, yeah, classic. You missed that. No, man. See, because when I was growing up, I lived in Windsor, Ontario, which is across. I could see downtown Detroit from my house. Crazy. Like when I was ten years old. Mm -hmm. So to me, rock and roll didn't come from anywhere except Detroit. I thought that's where they invented it. As rock and rolls, I thought Led Zeppelin was from Detroit. I thought (laughs) Rush was from Detroit because these are bands that came to play. And so I assume, well, they're playing Kisses from Detroit. That's what I, <laughs> yeah, they got yeah, right. a song that says right in it. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, man, I, I I just naively, I grew up with that. And hearing the radio, I didn't really have a sense of who was Canadian, who wasn't Canadian. To me, it was just right. all coming, it, it was legit because it was on the radio. Rock radio was really strong in those days uh, mm. when I lived there. So, I mean, I spent most of my growing up life there. And it wasn't until I left to go to Toronto in the uh, late 80s. And my first year in Toronto, I had a gig playing in a band. And the, the band was nominated for a Juno Award. I'm like, you mean like Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> wow. They're like, no, 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 dude, a Juno Award. I'm like, oh, is that because y'all got so many keyboards? Is that why? <laughs> like a Juno 106? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that wasn't the reason why. <laughs> As it turns out, I'm like, there's a whole thing here. There's like, mm-hmm. wow, there's like all these, you'll have your own bands and award shows and everything. So it was a real awakening for me. So I didn't, you know, I, I kind of lived that dual culture as a kid. I never actually adapted to metric. I'm kind of ashamed to say Celsius is a concept to me that I still don't. If you tell me it's 17 degrees, I grab a jean jacket, but do I leave, do I bring a jean jacket? Is that a jean <laughs> yeah, jacket yeah, or is yeah. that like a proper jacket? I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. quite know. I yeah. like 71 warm Fahrenheit degrees. That's still to me, I don't, that's just, that's just me growing up. Old school, exactly. But so, so my first awareness of music was coming across the river from Detroit and going to shows as a kid <laughs> learning to play music because I went to rock shows as a kid. And so that was my whole first exposure to it. Uh, it wasn't until years later, I found out all these bands, obviously some of them are from England. Turns out Rush is Canadian. I didn't know that at the time. Right. Hmm. Right. I think we're a lot, a lot of us are the same way because we all grew up, the radio was the radio and everybody was huge rock stars to us, whether they were Harlequin or the Rolling Stones or right. ACDC. Um, yeah, I think it's that's kind of the beauty of being Canadian is I imagine it's the same in Sweden or Australia. You know, they have their stuff and they I imagine everybody has their national pride to some degree. But 
music is music. You know what I mean? Well, we've but talked I think about you... this a lot too with the borders between, you know, where we, I guess, said, you know, up until you get to the Ontario border, everything west, all of those bands, the Queen City kids, a lot of, you know, kids <clears> growing <throat> up in Ontario, southern Ontario, you know, there was that imaginary line that I guess you just didn't see that. I didn't know there was another line, you know, between Ontario and Windsor, but, you know, I guess that's the case there too, because, yeah, you think that a lot of people that, grew up in Toronto, knew the Toronto bands and people who grew up in Winnipeg, knew everything West, but there was no, uh, there was no mix for sure. It didn't cross over as well, except for like the larger groups, like say Loverboy yeah, yeah. or something would have yeah. been sort of like national, but yeah, it, it, that is true. Until the glorious nineties. Until the glorious nineties, which, you know, you, you and I were a big part of that. Well, you, you were a bigger part of that, but the, well, uh, also <laughs> about the internet, you know, and well, the internet you yeah. had, by the time you had, music videos much music had high canadian content yeah that was that was a golden age man you had a whole industry just based on being rock stars in canada that's that was good enough you actually didn't have to leave anymore no. it was kind of kind of no. cool in that way so did you find with your guitar playing and all that kind of stuff being I don't even know how to, because you're, you're in earlier stuff, and I, I know you sort of came up with Molly Johnson and all that kind of thing in a more of a jazz world. Mm -hmm. I understand you started on bass, and we had this conversation with Sean last week, Sean Verrall from Widemouth, when he said that we, when you played with um, played bass with Widemouth for that run, it was like, you said that you started on bass, and I go, oh, really? I had no idea about that, because your guitar playing does not strike me as a guy who, uh, this is my secondary instrument, you know? <laughs> yeah. So what were your first bands just like you just picked up a bass and off you went kind of thing? Or Well, you know, when you're a kid, <clears throat> if you're unfortunate enough to be the oldest sibling, all my friends were youngest siblings. They all had older brothers with drums, right. basses, guitars. Everybody had instruments to jam. So I'd go to the jam and be kind of just hanging out with the dudes who were jamming. I was like, well, come on, I can do something. They were like, mm. yeah, you can do something. <laughs> Play bass. Play <laughs> bass? What the hey? What the heck, man? How come I got to play the bass? Well, Paul McCartney plays the bass. We're like, well, he's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, he's all right. He's yeah. from Detroit. <laughs> okay. He's from Detroit. Yeah. He's, he's from Detroit. You start naming <laughs> yeah. all the cool bass players. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I could play me some bass. Yeah. But I very quickly went from like garage jamming to paying gigs. Because I really yeah. wanted to play, man. I got really good really quick. But I got mm. good staying up all night, not doing homework or going to school. Mm. I did school and stay home and listen to the radio all day and play whatever came on the radio. I played great. care. I didn't like Fleetwood Mac, but I learned to play all the Fleetwood Mac songs. Oh, disco <laughs> was popular at the time. I learned to play disco songs. Sure. So I got I was hireable as a teenager. Before I started high school, I started getting paying gigs. Which meant wow. learn what's up, like some country yeah. songs, <clears throat> some do some two steps, some waltzes, some polkas, some Italian music. Oh, Nona's going to get up and sing the song she always sings at weddings. Oh, you better learn <laughs> that one. You know what I mean? So Nona, yeah, yeah. I, I just had a different uh, a different mentality about learning. I, I didn't just stay home and learn Jimmy Page licks because, much as I loved it, that wasn't going to make me any money. Mm and perpetuate the gear buying and just being right. gainfully employed as a musician. I, I knew I was never going to need an education because <laughs> I had a, you know, I had this great career plan already at the age of 16. <laughs> so parents love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to know like where the, the Latin and Afro Cuban influence came in. Cause I was listening to the, your most recent record, uh, eternity now. And as you get it, it's so interesting as it kind of morphs through the record. And then you get to, there's a couple songs, uh, I think, New Event Horizon. Mm -hmm. And it's like straight up Afro-Cuban influenced, you know, rhythms going on there. It was like, it's such a cool transition. You know, I mean, I love that eclectic stuff in music, and especially when you can cross genres like that. But where did that, when did that happen? Well, thank you for noticing. Because um, to me, you know, uh, it really, it goes back even to the early days. As a bass player, I also got gigs. You know, when I got really good by 1920, I was on kind of on fire on the bass, and I was the guy you hired around Detroit. If somebody couldn't make the gig, they could call me on a Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock to go across to Detroit and play three, 
three one hour sets of jazz fusion. <laughs> it's like, this isn't stuff we're not playing moany moany here you know I mean? it's like you no know, there's gonna be a bass solo i don't know when it's coming but there's gonna be one so i got really really good at the bass and playing jazz and fusion and funk and all this stuff part of that detroit scene was also some afro-cuban music really and i would get hired to play bass with those dudes and it wasn't about some bass slapping and bass soloing. It was a whole different mentality. So yeah. I got really into the discipline of that. Now, that was in the 80s. And then there's a big gap where you know, I learned all kinds of other music. I got way into reggae. Of course, living in Toronto, you can. Mm -hmm. There's the whole community there. Yeah. Uh, so reggae become a big part of my, my musical identity as well. Living in Texas, suddenly you discover that rock and roll is deeply informed by Tejano music. Right. Mexicans who've been living in this territory longer than there's been in America. You know what I mean? They've just been sure. here. Um, so that culture permeates our rock and roll. Of course, Doug Som and Flaco Jimenez and you know all those people like that that make that border rock mixing. It's not mariachi music. People think of Mexican music as mariachi music, but that's like urban proper music in mexico city guadalajara right. is where they play that in texas we it's tecano music it's rough it's cowboy music it's like country with some bavarian accordion polka like accordions right. a star here man i found out i came here for the guitar players i stayed for the accordion <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you start to name good texas guitar players you know it's it's also a really broad spectrum from lightning hopkins to dimebag daryl right a yeah. stretch, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, that, yeah but that all mm -hmm. comes from here of course then you get here and you find out no no the coolest the coolest dude in the yard is the accordion player they're the biggest <laughs> badass i mean that's everybody wants to know that dude and they stand and when they hold the accordion in texas it's not you know it's a whole different posture those dudes are like accordion <laughs> there's such a thing Accordion face. <laughs> accordion face. It's a real thing here. It's like, yeah. Do the big black hat with this great big. I like yeah. that. Do they get all the ladies? You can't mess with this. So that <laughs> that music starts to seep into what you're doing because you're playing it when you go out. It, it it's part mm -hmm. of what you do. I got back into bass playing recently, just being in Austin and not being on tour as much with Big Sugar. I kind of thought, man, maybe I'll start playing some bass and get myself some gigs and uh i started working with uh, a group that plays all afro cuban music with ray artiaga That's in amazing. austin a couple nights a week he was doing gigs all sung in spanish all latino dudes playing and this you know one pinky with a bass i was like i, I, know, <laughs> I know this music they're like well, okay uh Sure, dude. Uh, the guy counted off the clave. I'm right there. I already. I thought, oh, this music. That's, I know that's this. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's really awesome. deeply you into just, it. Really deeply you, into it. Living here as one. You, you, can. you must have because that's not a style you can just sort of learn and pick up by listening. I mean, you gotta well, like. Fake. Yeah. Bed. Yeah, you can't fake yeah. it. You gotta no. shit. You gotta play it with people, dudes. You gotta and know gig, it. Yeah. Really get it inside. I don't think it's going to catch on with like high school bands in in Saskatchewan. I don't think. Like, you know what we should do is have some Latin infused. Rock it might not happen. I don't know, but here, here it can happen because your friends, you know, half of the friends you know, you know, their last name is Martinez or. Mm. You know, so dudes bring that with them to the to the. Sure. Rock. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what I think was always so interesting about you your ability to kind of like. <laughs> That's a good. He, he was making fun of Shane him. earlier with his freeze face, and now we got yeah. one. Yeah. Sorry, there I'm go. back. I'm back. Don't worry. <laughs> I was I was just going into like just really renowned places here, yeah. but uh, no, like uh, Big Sugar being a, a very loud blues band. It sort of started off as a very aggressive, again, very loud. It was really loud, Gordy. <laughs> <laughs> Which I loved. I always loved. I, I, I there was always the conversation. Every time I would go somewhere, they would tell me about how many amps Gordy blew up last night. Gordy blew up like a a, a Marshall last night, or an SVT, or whatever you were blowing up. I blew up some stuff. 
<laughs> I broke some stuff. It's true. But it's part of your sound, though, isn't it? But I, but where I was going with this was it was sort of like this blues influence, influence thing. And then when you sort of, when the reggae started to appear, it was so seamlessly just kind of like, you know, beautifully put in there. Again, it seemed so legit that it was like, this is great. Like, it never felt... I don't know what the word is, but it never felt like uh, like you were trying on a pair of shoes. You were like, no, this, these, he owns these shoes. These are his shoes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, but you know, part of that, part of that was playing with Jamaican dudes. Yeah, I know. I had a Jamaican bass player and and drummer. And did Gary bring a lot of that in? I, I always wondered about that. Gary was that's so. All, that's all he did. He didn't. Gary he, was he the actually greatest. never played rock and roll with me. I wouldn't assume so. No. And yeah. most of the the. the you know the drummers like Crash and Rafa and dudes like that. They were, they were the first call guys in the reggae scene in Toronto. They'd come and play with Big Sugar, and I, it, I mean, it was kind of a fool's errand. But I started trying to get them to play rock and roll with me. It mm -hmm. just didn't. They didn't. They had no frame of refer reference. Right, Gary right, had yeah. never heard of Led Zeppelin until I told him. <laughs> you're kind of like this is kind of a Deep Purple thing. He wouldn't know what you're talking about. Yeah. No, he knew Jimi Hendrix was a black guy. Right, sure. That's what he said. Uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, no, I heard of Jimi Hendrix. He, the, he was a black guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he was on top of uh, other achievements. Um, he had never heard Led Zeppelin. And then we played him Stairway to Heaven. And it was the first time he heard Stairway to Heaven. This is really? 1995, wow. y'all. <laughs> first wow. time Gary Lowe heard Stairway to Heaven. And he heard it. And just picture Stairway to Heaven. It's the remastered CD box set. You know? <laughs> sure, yeah. And we listened to all of Zeppelin IV. And at the end of Stairway to Heaven, you can picture it. The symbols are just dying down in Robert Plant's Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> we're just, we're blown away. This CD <laughs> sounds so amazing. A song you know so well. And from the back of the van, Gary Lowe says, yeah, man, man, tell me one time is a very famous song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stairway in heaven. Yeah, man, we hear about that song one time. One time is a very famous song. That's amazing. And then they said, now put on some Harlequin. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the thing is, Gary was right. It was a very famous song, you see. And yeah. uh, he had seen uh, Moja, our, we had a rhythm guitar player from Trinidad. And he came to Canada. These guys all came to Canada in the 70s during sure. political instability in their, you know, in Jamaica. They came to Canada and ended up with jobs like Northern Telecom going up telephone poles. And they all had electrical, you know, engineering certificates that they got at trade wow. schools in Jamaica. So mm. these guys were sent to Northern Manitoba, Northern Saskatchewan, you know, Lac La Range and Flin Flon to run <laughs> telephone cables. Oh, my God. Imagine you come from down, like, Kingston, Par Jamaica. Yeah, paradise. And you go. Yeah, next week, you're up a, Flin you're up a pole <laughs> in, in Lac La Ronge. <laughs> Whoa. But uh, they, you know, they, so they had a very weird filtered experience with Canadian culture where some stuff just didn't reach them, but other stuff Of did. course. Of course, yeah. Mamoja told me a great story. He said, uh, he said, uh, I was trying to teach the band a song. It said, we're in the middle of one of our songs. If I had my way, when we go to the bridge, it's the same chords as Shine On You Crazy Diamond. So this nice. would be wicked. I'll show, I'll, show you, I'll show you how it goes. And I taught them the whole thing. <laughs> and at some point, Mojo went, oh, who's singing that song? The man name, Crazy Shining Diamond. What is my name? <laughs> Oh, because I see him on one time sing that song. You know, I think, no, one time, Gordy Johnson, one time I hear him on sing song. The man named Floyd. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, that man sing the song. That man, Floyd. yeah. Well, I, I don't go to see Floyd. I originally go to see Gentle Giant. Oh, okay. But I have our next man on the show, and the name Floyd. And it's <laughs> crazy shining diamond. Yes. <laughs> crazy shining diamond. I like this. I love it. This was the filter. So if 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 you think 
the reggae ingredients and big sugar sound authentic well that's <laughs> why yeah I, I was using import you know like of my, course yeah these guys brought what they brought to it and i just let them do it the way they did it filter through their experience i stopped trying to show them very early on i'm like that this is not happening play the, well how do you think it should go what <laughs> yeah, yeah i bet i bet and it yeah, challenged Gary me was... as a musician i had to fit into my own band I mean, yeah, exactly yeah so in reality, bringing those guys in just altered the entire pH level of what was Big big Sugar completely. Yeah, when I had jazzier guys playing with me, it was more experimental and kind of jazzy and bluesy. Yes. Yes. And I also had to, you know, I was in an environment that I had to fit into. As I started working with different people, I like to, if if it brings about a change in me as a musician, it, it's... It's more challenging and more satisfying, ultimately. Same thing with putting a band together in Texas, working with guys like Ray Arteaga. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he brings that Latin. He doesn't count one, two, three, four. You know, I mean, that's not how he counts. It's like. Clave. <clears throat> it's clave. So I got to give wow. him clave at the. This is how we start the song. You know, one, two. No, sorry. Uh, that's crazy. No. Crazy. Yeah, wow. It's a. It's a challenge, and it, like I said, it just makes keeps it interesting. That's the thing, yeah. Keeping things interesting is it's important. I mean, it's it's too easy to kind of lay back on what you know and what you do, isn't it? It can be, and I, I just maybe I've just always had an appetite for different sounds and different musical challenges. You know, that's I mean, been clear. And not to uh, not to stray from the uh, the topic, but as the uh, the comments go by, we try to you know bring in as many questions as we possibly can. But uh, somebody was asking Gordy, I don't know if you see this on your screen or not, but any chance any of heated he and some other LPs getting the reissue treatment like the Hemivision did? Absolutely, yeah. We had a great success this year uh, releasing yeah, Hemivision. a vinyl version of Hemivision. Um, I was able to go through the master tapes. Uh, in conjunction with Universal Music, go back to the vaults and get stuff sent to me here in my studio and get to tweak on a little bit. So there's a whole record of uh, bonus material Great. as well as remastered original stuff. Uh, you know, you get to start going through the old photos and scrapbooks and stuff that's just not going to show up online. You know, we were able mm -hmm. to go through our own shoe boxes and photographs from the 90s and contact cool. shoes and stuff so amazing to be able to to recreate that packaging with the original photographs and negatives and all that stuff uh and we had such a fantastic um, even throughout covid the, the hemivision release has been really really uh successful for us so we are i just approved the mastering for 500 pounds cool which is our one of our earliest records and kind of the record that introduced us to America and to so many people, Europe, it, it took us all over the world, that record. And to this day, I still I still get shout outs from people who who love Ride Like Hell. You know, Of course. Yeah. I, I saw a thing where you were talking about like the Warren Haynes guys and Charlie Drake, uh, Charlie uh, Sexton, Sexton, all those guys. Like that's where your connection to Texas probably started, I assume. That's because of that record and because of Ride Like Hell that that started my whole connection with Texas in the early nineties. And even, I think it's probably the reason why I get, yeah, you know, I got to meet Billy Gibbons and work with Gibbons is because I've had long involved conversations with him about uh, ride like hell, not the Grady version, <laughs> the version. Now yeah. I need to talk about that. I was like, we yeah. do, but <laughs> so I put it out in, you know, like almost 30 years ago, but we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What we need to do about it now, but we need to talk about that. So pretty cool when your hero, one of your all-time like tone gurus, calls you up and says, "We need to talk." Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, I, I your, always uh, go ahead, Corey. What was your route into the states as a Canadian? How did you manage to settle there? And why <laughs> are you legally there, Gordy, or are we alarmed? Or, or is that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. apparently he walked across that bridge to Detroit so many times they probably yeah, just, yeah, they just they knew him by know. name. Oh, come on okay. over, Gordy. First of all, and maybe I, before been, that, funny you mentioned, how did you meet your wife from Red Deer? <laughs> well, <laughs> unrelated, but um the uh crossing the, the border in Detroit, you used to be able to just take the tunnel bus and go do right. a gig. And that was right. 
you know, do you, do you have bus fare home? Okay, you're good. Come on in. We were talking about huh. the 1970s and 80s. Super yeah. easy as it's gotten harder. Uh, but I've had a work visa through the Musicians Union since the 1980s. Whenever wow. they started having the little card you had to have, mm. I started having one. And I've always, I've always kept it up. A P2 visa, I've had one for, you know, 30 years. So when I went to apply for status, they look at that. And I was able to get nice letters from from notable people. Willie Nelson wrote me a letter saying wow. he's a he's a benefit to our musical community and our, you know, and he's an <laughs> asset to America. Please let him in. Wrote it on a bar napkin. Is that right? <laughs> That's amazing. As it when should I be. Went, I went to his niece and I was like, Can you, did you get the Willie letter? I waited two and a half years to get a reference letter from Willie. Wow. Because I worked at his studio for years and I did. I mean, I'm not his homie. Like, I don't know him. I haven't golfed with him. I, <laughs> I've told jokes with him before, but I, right. I, I yeah. had a bodyguard for him one night. Oh, <laughs> um, really? Wow. I did. It On the spot, there's like, I'm the biggest guy standing near him. And <laughs> same thing as he's like, Gordon, we don't have security. Can you get him to the tour bus? I'm like, uh, there's 400 <laughs> people in this room. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> you know, Amazing. No mag light in the eyes. Like, excuse me, <laughs> to the left, coming through. <laughs> yeah. um, Was Texas an easy uh, place to go to? Like, it w was it between any other cities in your mind? No. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to Texas. I actually okay. wondered that. Nashville never rang your bell, none of that kind of stuff? No, man. I've been coming here since the early 90s. My first right. time here was like 93. And I just, as soon as I got here, I, I didn't want to go home. I had to go home because I had this, I had a band going and sort of a career happening. But I sure. always just wanted to be here. I just, I loved it here. My friends are here. The culture. It's, I mean, the weather is one thing. Uh, it doesn't suck. I'll tell you. No, no. You have yeah, to no, be, no, no. You know, I can wear a tube top on a day like today. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that just derailed the whole train. Yeah. Uh, no, be, you know, uh, so yeah, Texas was the destination that was always in the back of my mind. Whenever things got screwy with the record label or management or the band or anything got sideways, I got on a plane. I came to Texas and wrote it out wrote records down here just hung out here just always had a refuge here and your uh, wife was always game like oh, okay yeah sure yeah well, i mean she's yeah. from red deer so it's kind of like texas canada in a sense <laughs> those were one of the those were some of the you know prenuptial terms is like you got to take me somewhere warm. I'm not, oh, yeah. I'll marry you here, but I ain't staying here. <laughs> Why were you in Red Deer? Were no, you? My, because there. my wife's from Red Deer. My, my wife, uh, her family was a prominent cattle ranching family, and her father That's had right. been the, the mayor of Penhold at one time. Oh, wow. Penhold. Name dropping some Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> the the you the know when you're Alberta street cred. Not that yeah. there you go. My Canadian passport comes with it's sprinkled with tidbits of knowledge, <laughs> yeah, like exactly the best yeah. Chinese food in Innisfail, things like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> Sammy's one. just so anybody's asking. But uh, yeah, so we got married on the farm, and our kids were all born in Alberta, and we still have farmland, and we're there all the time. We just got to commute. Of course, haven't done mm -hmm. lately as much commuting. Um, but that, so that's always, we've always had one foot firmly planted on Alberta farm soil. Mm -hmm. And then coming back to Texas, culturally, a lot of similarities. But I mean, of course, you know, the whole Tex-Mex thing, the food and the music and that part of the culture here was always a beacon for me. So it, it, it really wasn't between like here in New York City. I never, LA wasn't my, my scene. It, Nashville didn't have much appeal to me. Really, it was just, Austin, Texas. Hmm. And it's still, although it's changed to the point of almost being unrecognizable to the Austin I used to know, it really has changed a lot. But there's still, there's still that thing about it where it's like there isn't really an industry here, which is, I mean, maybe that's what I dig about it. Right. Like we've all lived in in and lived and breathed in the music industry and you know what that's like it can get kind of intense where there, sure. someone's always schmoozing 
Someone's right. always looking for a gig, a leg up. What are you doing? Who's your manager? Who's your publicist? Well, are you guys are like blowing up right now. Who's your publicist? Who's your this? Who's <laughs> it's like, I don't, man, I don't love that. I don't, that's not why I got in here. It's not right. why I do that. I don't really want to talk about that or hear about it. So right. being in Austin's awesome for that because on a Tuesday night, you'd be doing a gig with Billy Gibbons would be playing pool behind the stage. Jimmy Vaughn might be sitting at the bar. Lance Armstrong punched me in the arm one night after a Grady gig. It was like, good show, man. Oof. Oh, oh. <laughs> like, wow. It was a good, good show. show. Why did you ruin my career? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, there's, there's people walking around just unassumedly. They're just kind of hanging like everyone's no one's doing anything. There's no one showcasing, but everyone's right. showboating. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Because you got you play for keeps. Every yeah. Every time yeah. you leave the house, because you don't know who's sitting out there. Totally. Like, you know I mean the greatest? You know the uh, yeah, Quentin Tarantino's at the bar tonight. You yeah. Don't play any different just because he's here? Because you don't know who's mm. who's where. You know. Right. But all those people filter through here, and they only come here to just kind of hang out. Right. Yeah, which is a different energy level. You're you're allowed to just think about playing your music. Yeah, and yeah. Like, I what shot would the playing to play Tarantino me. sound like. I guess you'd have to start the song in the middle and then go to the beginning and then to the end. Is that how it <laughs> yeah. works? Tarantino arrangements. I, yeah. I got you. The guitar <laughs> solo is only on the bonus DVD. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But Texas is it for me, man. And exactly. uh, no, and getting my, you know, getting my status here. And uh, you know, I'll just in advance, I'll preface this by saying, okay, all y'all shut up. But I got the Einstein visa. It's not because of uh, I didn't have to pass a test. Wow. But it's called the Einstein visa. It's like you have some particular skill set which is unique, and you're really good at stuff. Well, and Austin is also one of those towns that is a music town, and they pride themselves on looking after musicians and stuff like that, too. It, it, it's They're, different than Nashville in that Nashville is a music town, but Austin has always been really supportive of its of its musicians and its music scene. There certainly are uh, a few people who have held the torch and kept it going. Steve Wertheimer, who owns the Continental Club and a couple of other clubs and businesses around Austin, he's kept... He loved Austin in the 70s and the 80s, and he's just kept the vibe alive. He puts on the the Hot Rod show every year, and he puts on a whole parallel universe to South by Southwest. It He's just made always made it okay for musicians, and he's just one of those cats. I mean, he, I got to name drop him because, you know, someone like Gary Clark, he's all big and right. celebrated now. But when he was playing to 15 people on a Monday blues matinee, there was nobody there. Steve still paid him. You know, he liked oh, Steve sure. paid guys. He doesn't like to see musicians going hungry. You right. come and work for me, you'll get paid. Where so many clubs are still like you pass the hat around and divvy it up. It's like everybody got seven dollars. Right. Know? So I'm not sure that the population of Austin is still taking care of its musicians. I don't think that's still true. In but many cases, are, $7 is not that much different than a major label deal. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Except you'd have to pay back the $7. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's your $7, but yeah. You, yeah, you do have to pay it back. You have to pay it back, yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> no, you're right, though. I, I think it's, you know, I've always quoted you as saying to me one time, you said every guitar has a song in it, and I always think I always think of that every time I pick up a new guitar. I always go, "There's a song in this guitar." It's just a matter of like, which I think I sort of equated it to when you get a new guitar, you just play the shit out of it, and it's, new stuff just starts to present itself. But I've always quoted you as sort of saying that to me one time, like every guitar has a has a song in it. I go, "He's right." So I try to explain that to my wife why we have so many guitars around the house. <laughs> oh, so, oh, so I get the blame. You know, some yeah. guitars look back there. Some guitars there have, two, have two. There you songs go. In them. I bet. Yeah. Those ones got a lot of songs in them, yeah. That one's got two songs in it. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Twice, right. twice as many songs. Or a song that's twice as long. Turns out, yeah, double neck guitar, <laughs> the songs usually end up twice as long. Stairway to the Heaven, or however, <laughs> however Gary called heaven. it. Stairway in Heaven. That's what it was, yeah. 
$14. So where did, the, where did the picking style come from? Had you had you always played? I remember you playing. Uh, I don't know if you if if it's just my memory, but I remember you playing normal plectrum style, and then out you came did. the finger picks. I don't know if I remember that or if I'm just. I think you're. I think that's a yeah. No, that's a fallacy. You, you must have dreamed it. I might have Why dreamed you're dreaming it, yeah. about me, I don't know. Hopefully, I, I, I wasn't wearing a tube top. To come up with more excuses for more guitars, probably. <laughs> Hopefully, I wasn't wearing a tube top in the dream yeah. that you had about me playing with a plectrum. Um, oh, <laughs> so that can be your next video. Covered. As long as I've known you, you've always played. You've always played this with the claws. Uh, Damn, you and it's you like and banjo, banjo picks. Yeah, because I played a banjo. I there played the banjo, and my early experience with guitar was mostly playing like folk blues, ragtime, not really bluegrass, but Dixieland and early jazz and things like that, and playing it on a banjo, which has a particular feel to it. And it's percussive. It's a more of a percussive percussion. Instrument. Totally. You kind of, it's like a washboard. You kind of rack the picks against the strings. You mute down the strings and you get that. It is that kind right, of thing yeah, yeah. that you can't get with a flat pick. It's just not really the same thing. Um, and I like the sound of metal on metal. I, I used really, really heavy strings right from the very get go. And they could take. Mm -hmm that metal on on metal it could take my attack and it's just rhythmically i get more up and down movement from my wrist as opposed mm -hmm. to picking as a with a flat pick is a very tight movement you know you're it's a it's a short small movement with your wrist whereas for me i just toss my hand and let let momentum do the work when i'm yeah yeah reggae rhythm or or whatever it happens to be it's like I'll Beetlejuice, like so you can't say metal on metal one more time, or lips is going to come out somewhere. That's right. Yeah, well, suddenly Anvil will show up. Metal. Yeah. His ears are burning somewhere. And yeah. I got to meet lips because of Ride Like Hell. How about that? Ah. Once again. It all comes full circle. I was so stoked to meet lips. I got to, after that movie came out, they played in Austin, <laughs> and we couldn't believe we were going to go see Anvil. I'm like, thank God for DVDs. These guys are coming to Austin. Amazing. So, I, again, I didn't know they were Canadian. I didn't know hmm. that. I had no idea what their story was. I just uh, knew about Anvil. Yeah. So, when they, man, when they came to Austin, and I knew that the promoter and the venue guys were really cool because they all knew Grady. So, me and Big Ben from Grady are cowboy hats and <laughs> walk through the venue. We go up the stairs behind Emo's, and there's Lips in the dressing room. He's like, Gordy, man. I'm like, well, how do you, what? How do you know? He's like, oh, dude, when you guys were making Hemi Vision, man, I went to the phase one studio when, uh, when Paul Gross owned it. And he said, okay, you can go and look at the gear, man, but don't touch anything. Those guys are going to freak out. I'm like, I'm dreaming this. I'm going to wake up later and go, whoa, that's cool. How many shots did I have? No, that really happened. You want to talk about Big Sugar? I'm like, no, that I want to talk about Anvil. Yeah. So that, so you're, you're amazing. He's like, no, dude, you're amazing. Like, is this oh, happening? Hilarious. Is this conversation even happening? Um, well, you'll be happy. No, he was a guest on here. Your what? audio is your audio is way better than his was. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of our more memorable episodes. Yeah, yeah, for that very reason. The last, the mm. last line of the whole episode. What? Oh, you guys are in a band? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't realize we were musicians at all. Just yeah. a bunch of guys interviewing. <laughs> lips, essentially. Especially guys who happen to have Neumann mics in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just yeah. So you're working. Oh, that's so funny. Were we no, talking uh, about, um, let's talk about, you know, I sort to cut you off, but I, I really, I was always fascinated to find you're still playing with trainer amplifiers and garnet amplifiers after, mm -hmm. you know, and to see them on like a, in a, in a, in a Austin studio to see like garnet amplifiers from Winnipeg, Manitoba and trainer, I think is from Ontario. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Classics, man. I, I so you just you just kind of have always sort of played in that world and, and maintained Canadian gear. 
Um, oh yeah, I try to maintain my. I staff. know you've experimented with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you got to know Penhall or Penhall, Alberta, yeah. and you have to yeah. have trainer amplifiers. Yeah. yeah, but I know that you've played every different kind of amplifier there is. But I find it curious. You know, in the 21st century now, you're like, I'm going to use the tried and true Canadian. Man, that uh, especially Garnet. I mean, with trainer. Um, I mean, I've used their amps time to time. Uh, the speaker cabinets, just because they're such that their support system is so great. I mean, really, with any endorsement, it's one thing if you get endorsed by somebody who makes gear that you really like. Okay, that's awesome. But if you don't have the support from them, then it just becomes like a burden to, oh, well, I I play these amps because I'm supposed to, but damn, I'm having trouble with my sound tonight. And oh, I blew a speaker, and how am I going to get another? You know, mm -hmm. with Trainer, I never had that, and that's part of my like my relationship with Long McQuaid and Trainer amplifiers. I've been going to shop at Long McQuaid since the seventies. Like, sure, I've yeah. owed them, which means I've owed the money since. The 70s. <laughs> <laughs> that's what. That's the true story. Of why you're in Austin? That's, yeah, to get away from <laughs> the get apartment at L and M. Oh, those street. guys will uh, find you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, they will find you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, they, they've just been an amazing support system. When I couldn't pay my bill, they didn't repo the gear. They let me keep doing gigs so that I could pay my bill. I mean, it's just cool. smart, you know? Yeah. Um, sure. So I've always been very supportive. So getting in a deal with Trainer, I was like, yeah, you guys have been an amazing support system my whole career. When I was nobody, and now I'm kind of somebody, and I'm doing stuff far from home, it's great to have that support of being able to just go into a music store and say, Hey, uh, by the way, it's it's me, and I broke this. Can I have another one? <laughs> They're like, I'll need to talk to somebody in Toronto. Oh, hey, no, that's Gordy. Yeah, man, just give him one for me. Yeah. I, I like hearing that because anybody that's not in the music business doesn't understand the idea of, I broke this, can I have another one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And I, as you stated earlier, I break stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like speakers sometimes. Yes. Yeah, they get fatigued. Let's say they're a bit fragile on occasion. A bit yeah. fragile. So I have a great, I have a great relationship with eminent speakers and with trainer. So I've, I've always got cabinets full of super tough, ready to rock speakers wherever I go in the world. It's an amazing relationship with Garnet. Man, I was pulling my hair out. As you can see, it, it, <laughs> that's, that's where you start. You pull your hair out there. Yeah, that's what happens. I, this way. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I was blowing up a Marshall amp every week. I had a licensed electrician on staff on tour. I think there had to be a bump <laughs> for an electrician. What? Something's <laughs> not right here. You need to rethink your game plan here. And I love the old Marshalls. They're great sounding amps, but they couldn't take it. I mean, they're they're antique. It's like if you've ever owned an old car or an old motorcycle or old gear, it's all the same, man. You got to have sure. a toolbox. You got to know how to fix yeah. it because it's going to leave you at the side of the road. And I just had a nervous breakdown from, from gear failure. And I went into a store there on, on Queen Street, just like a pawn shop, a used, used music store. And I was looking, I thought maybe a Marshall rack mountable thing. I thought, nah, I don't think I'm ready to do that just yet. I don't know. I like the simplicity of the tube amps, you know. Mm -hmm. I found this weird garnet thing. And I remember garnet because I was born in Winnipeg. Sure, yeah. The and guess who? Yeah. And as a kid, my buddies all had garnet, you know, garnet amps. A little dudes in the high school band or whatever. We had garnet amps in the high mm -hmm. school. Like, garnet. Oh, god damn, look at that. And it looked like an amp. But it only had two knobs on it. I'm like, well, right. what, what does it do? The guy in the store was like, it was Songbird Music on Queen Street. They're not there anymore. But Songbird, they were like, well, near as we can tell, it's not an amp. I'm like, yeah, but it's the size of an amp. Because I think it's a, it's like a fuzz box or a distortion pedal, only without the convenience of it being as big <laughs> as the size of an amp. I'm like, really? <laughs> so what do you do with it? Well, I guess you could use it as a preamp. I think, yes, you could. <laughs> so I took that. It has volume in, volume out. The, much, the amount you put in is how much distortion you get from the one tube that's in there. And the out is just kind of like a unity volume. 
It just, you put it up to zero and you're at unity. So then I just started playing through power amps like SVTs, bass amps right. that mm -hmm. at two ohms can kick out 750 watts of stress-free tube power. I use QSC PA, you know, 1000 watt PA heads that just a power <laughs> amp. It's like you were going to run the monitor rig off it, but I can run my guitar rig off it because I wasn't getting any of the tone from it. Didn't matter. This thing that was that tu that tube heat that I wanted, as loud as I want, anywhere I go, any night of the year, it doesn't matter what's on the backline list in London, England. That's mm -hmm. cool. What do you got? An amp that works? Good. Tone right in. Like you can plug in the back of an amp and not even worry about the front of it. It was so freeing. And so I started buying these things up. I got it for 120 bucks, by the way. Wow. Yeah. Nice. They're not $120 now. No, I would assume now. not. No. You can add some zeros to that. Um, so I just started buying them up everywhere. I've got a dozen of them squirreled away now because I never want to be without them. And uh, yeah, I've laid them on my friends and they're just, it's an amazing tone circuit. It helps if you make a good sound to begin with. Like right. there is some onus on the player to make good guitar sound to plug into it. It, it doesn't sure. make anybody sound awesome. But if you already make a good sound, I plug into that and just like, okay, well, the discussion's over. I, wow. I never, from that day, I haven't ever had one of those like, oh, I'm searching for that perfect tone. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I've been good. I'm good. That's now so it's cool. An excuse to buy gear. I don't need to change the tone. <laughs> it's just that the tone's good. Now there's a signature model. Is that, is there a, gar, a, um, a Garnet Gordy Johnson model or, or I am I just making that up? There was. Oh, okay. There, well then. There isn't. But I'm putting that bug in their ear now. But the, the thing is, they have, talk about great support coming through Winnipeg, if one of them is sick, Pete Thiessen at, at, uh, at Garnet has fixed it between soundcheck and showtime and made it like brand new with all parts. Wow. Of it. He's done it to me so many times. And then he just built me one and sent it to me. Like I've got one with the Ethiopian flag. I've I got saw that one with the Jamaican flag colors, like just they're, they're little beautiful works of art too and design. Great. Uh, so yeah, no, that's another just great company. That's, always been super supportive and when gar was alive when gar gillies was alive man i never went through winnipeg where i didn't go to his shop oh wow whatever we had to be doing in winnipeg press and promo what no uh but hold up so on portage <laughs> avenue just go two blocks over you know i knew where his little tv repair shop was and I'd always go in there and he would dump his sandwich out on the counter take this greasy little paper sack and fill it with vacuum tubes. <laughs> Yo, Gord, you use the Herzog. You're still using the Herzog. Okay, well, you're going to, you know, you're going to go through some tubes. So you grab a handful of tubes and a little paper, brown paper sack and hand them to me. That's awesome. And, and of course, every, if I now, if I sold those tubes on eBay, it's like a Western electric tube from the 1930s in perfect, pristine condition. You know I mean? twelve hundred dollars for it not that i'd ever sell them but you know I just the guy was so generous and unassuming and awesome cat to, to have known that's awesome did you also go to uh levy's guitar straps in winnipeg uh no but i have used their guitar straps they make yeah, a pretty, fine guitar strap uh -huh, pretty much everybody has used a levy's guitar strap and they come right from winnipeg everything and you're from winnipeg isn't that correct i was born, born. in the St. Bonkers hospital yeah there you go. Amazing. It all comes back to Winnipeg. I got it always around. comes back to Winnipeg. One time we're standing in the Ro in the Coliseum in Rome and Brent Fence points. He goes, check it out. Some guy standing there with a Winnipeg Jets jersey on. I go, it's everywhere. No matter where I am, there's a Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brent brings them with him, though, and just hands them out. And then I think so. <laughs> he plants it before he goes anywhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Amazing. It's just a free shirt, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, <laughs> we probably kept you long enough, my friend. I, I feel like that we've covered a lot of ground. So what what I know that we always kind of end on what was supposed to happen in, in 2020. You put out a record you were supposed to be supporting. And then I assume that you'll be making up for that when it finally lightens up a bit. Have you been back to Canada the entire time? None. Of, I haven't. None of us have. 
I have actually, because I can drive oh. from here to my farm. We got to the border, like, will you have to quarantine? I, no problem. It'd be me and 300 head of cattle for the next month. That's <laughs> fine. No. Wow. So, yeah, easy to, to quarantine. So we did go up uh, and spend some time uh, up in Canada. Because, I mean, we still like I said, we still have property there and stuff yeah. gets taken care of and the house. Cool. And how, how long does it take you to drive from Austin to Red Deer? Oof. And see, this is where rock and roll comes in handy. Most twenty-four you know, hours. How many? How many? Albums. How many Don't Van Halen albums from Austin to? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's like thirty-six hours, I think. Oh wow! Okay. In one shot. Wow. wow! Of course. There you wow. go. Us road dogs can do that easy. Yeah. Yeah, man. My of course, you know, I get to my parents' house in Medicine Hat, and I'm trying to, you know. We're about to leave my mom and dad's, and I'm trying to put all of it. You know, I got three kids and two pets, and I'm trying to load stuff in the back of the truck. And my dad's out there, like pulling stuff out, going, "No, you're never going to fit it on there." I'm like, "Hey, man, you weren't in a <laughs> punk rock band. I was in a freaking punk rock band. I can load a van. You can't load a van. I can load a van. And when I'm done loading that van, I can drive it for 36 hours till I get to Texas." <laughs> <laughs> You can't mess with the punk rockers, man. They, they That's know right. How to get it done on soda pop and Seven Eleven hot dogs, and yeah, truck stop food, baby. Absolutely, six hours all the way. Yeah. So what's what's twenty twenty one going to present? Are you going to be able to go out and support the album that you didn't get to support, or is that kind of may as well put out a new record? Or I mean, what's going to happen? Uh, I've been really busy, man. Like aside from making videos and stuff on YouTube and having different series that we put out, um, I've made about 40 reggae records over wow. the past year. Um, I started recording because well, I was playing everything week. anyway, and I love me some reggae. So I started doing reggae remixes of stuff for people. Uh, cool. and then I started just making these reggae rhythms and going, well, you know, it'd be cool as if, got somebody to sing on this but i can get four or five different artists to sing on one rhythm so the music stays the same but there's a whole different song on top of it cool and that's sort of a model of the jamaican music industry but that dates back to the 1960s so i thought man i get in on that in terms of publishing it's kind of cool because mm. i have to write the song once <laughs> but I'm gonna get eight different song titles out of it, so it's kind of cool. Genius! Uh, and it's in introduced me just by just cold calling people on WhatsApp or or Facebook Messenger or whatever. You find these artists online, and I'm working with artists from Kenya, Mozambique, Jamaica, Trinidad, wow. U.S. Cal people got in California, dudes in Toronto, like reggae artists from all over on big sugar rhythms and i was just kind of doing it for kicks but now i have an enormous catalog of this stuff so we're gonna start a, our own label imprint whatever you want to call it and put all of these artists out their cool. own records they can promote on themselves but all under the big sugar banner mm -hmm. so big sugar Great. becomes something beyond a loud blues rock band it's also a reggae record label mm -hmm. and a video editing <laughs> empire and uh i don't know what else um that i have used a music, music store record started just because again I, I got time yes uh, so i started I'm about halfway through i've written most of it and kind of ready to to record it so we can do that i also have enough blues recordings that were done in the last year for our youtube series i think there's 14 or 15 of them of me playing just great old blues classics but with different friends like i got joe satriani did one with me uh, cool the black crows right. did one with me i did one with sue foley just people from they can phone it in they can film themselves at home i can edit the video together and it's us playing the blues i've got a dozen more of those i could put out a double vinyl of me playing the blues so that's so cool i if if touring doesn't happen again this year for whatever reason maybe it will maybe it won't i'll just still keep making stuff that's what you do yeah because yeah. do you record the big sugar stuff in austin do you like bring bring the guys down or are you kind of like uh, uh, well now i'm now i'm kind of self-sufficient i mean i had in the past always 
there were always about a dozen people in Big Sugar. Yeah. Because it's whoever was best suited to playing a thing, they would come in and play. Sure. So the band was always sort of ego free that way. Right. Uh, Eternity Now was made with the dudes I had with me at that moment. My wife and I wrote all the songs. So she's on the record. Ray, I was playing with all the time. So Ray Arteaga played percussion. Chris Kolpa from New Brunswick, a great guitar player. And we both have an interest in drums. I was like, dude, your drumming's wicked. Be in Big Sugar for a year. So he was in Big Sugar for a year. Cool. Um, and Big Ben, uh, yeah. my, my bandmate from Grady, he lives in Austin. So he was yep. here when, when Gary got sick. And of course, he, he passed away. Um, rather than stopping, I just worked with the people I had around me. And so that's the band on Eternity Now. Now that I'm isolated in here, I'm playing drums every day. I've played drums. Yeah. I've been watching that. That's great. I mean, I just played on a, on this country record I'm producing. I played all the drums on it. I played on every reggae rhythm I put out this year. I just keep playing the drums. So I've, like, I've already started recording. I can play the drums, play some bass, put the guitars, some Mellotron, and funky keyboards. Cool. I just, I just can make it. It's big sugar. One stop got, shop. Got my That's name. great. That's great. Yeah, I got yeah, one I mean, last definitely, question. Definitely set the bar. You know, 40 uh, albums in one year. That's uh, you guys really got to step up yeah. the game here. You know, oh, I know, yeah. right? Yeah, it's. It, well, I got nothing else to do, y'all. It's got to make supper. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Corey. Go ahead. Uh, one last question for you: Are you able to find any Ukrainian food down in Texas? If I make it, uh, <laughs> and I do make it, I tell you what, man. My pedahe is like dialed. Uh, my Ooh. pierogies, it's uh, an all day thing, man. Dough, I mean, I'm talking about four to five hours of dough kneading. That wow. dough is like a newborn baby's bottom when it's, <laughs> it's just like, it's ugh, so good. I got uh, my borscht is on point, uh, yep. my halabchi, all of that stuff, man. You ever I, make kucha? I don't. You know, my mother couldn't stand it as a kid. So uh, she never made it. Hmm. She was made to eat it at holidays and stuff. She didn't like it. Okay. And so the the one time I asked her, I said, like, can you, but you have your mother's recipe for a kutia. Can you just, can you tell me how, can you send it to me? So I got her an iPhone. She took a picture of it, sent me the recipe. And I just, I never got past the first line. The first line of the kutia recipe, go in the yard and pick a cup of wheat. <laughs> 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 all right this is this exceeds my yeah. skill set i'm not yeah i'm yeah. not making this anybody that doesn't know what kucha is it's kind of like a, a wheat berry dessert so it's like if you take a handful of wheat and you soak it to the point where you can actually chew it then you add a little sugar and some poppy seed and whatever else i've had it different ways but uh it's it's kind of like a dessert ukrainians eat at like you said holiday time it's yeah. delicious but you have to pick your own wheat first. So. You gotta pick your own wheat. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> you lost me at step one. Yeah, yeah. And you have to play the accordion music in the background while you're doing it, right? There you that's go. That's right. Or accordion accordion music. There you go. The yeah. Ukrainian yeah. music also has uh, accordion involved. Yeah. Yeah. Be? And Italian music. <laughs> yeah. My dad owns an Italian restaurant, so I can cook Italian food. Like there you go. Nobody nice. business. All the stuff I can't get around here, I can just do. Yeah. No, it looks but like we got to stop by. I don't know how to smoke a brisket. I don't know how to smoke back ribs. Like there are people who devoted their lives to applying smoke yeah. to meat. I don't. It doesn't need to be me. I'll just pay someone to do that. That's cool. It sounds like we have to stop by the old uh, Johnson Ranch next time we're in Texas. <laughs> get ourselves some some Ukrainian food. I'll get yeah. y'all fed, man. I, I can feed the masses. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Well, my friend, oh, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for breaking off a, an hour or so with us. That was really fun, man. I, I'm really excited to see what comes next because the last record was really great. I'm Thanks, really excited fella. to hear what comes next. Well, I'm very flattered to have been invited. It's a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. Yeah. Anytime always. we want to put on our tube tops and do this again, just you know, <laughs> shoot me a text and we'll... Uh... Done. It'll be That's done. Cool. I, I, I'm going to get my like Chrissy Snow from Three's Company era tube top out <laughs> exactly dude i just did the math today just like bored because three's company was on in the other room and i said to myself i'm watching mr furley and i go how old was don knots in this first season of of his appearance 
55, so dude. He was damn. 55. And I was like, damn, dude. He was only 55. He looks, I don't know, at least 60 something. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, oh wow, dude. I'm heading into that first season of Mr. Furley Age. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. Well, you wear it a little That's bit better. Like, but I plan to be way more flamboyant than him in my... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've, we've seen you. Exactly, yeah. Uh, but I've it's going to be... Instagram. It's going to make Mrs. Doubtfire look... But... Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, when my dad was your age, he was not rocking hard in the place. It's... Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, I really appreciate you being here, and it's lovely to see the boys again. And uh, I don't, we don't have anybody lined up for next week. So if you know anybody, Gordy, because we got you from uh, from Sean. So you know, if you can think of anybody who'd be a lot of fun, let us know. I can. We've talked to hockey players. We've talked to actors. We've talked to. Uh, Do they need a Canadian passport? Not necessarily. No. No. Canadian, like you said, Canadian uh, passport. Yeah. <laughs> a Canadian passport. Yeah, no. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll we'll, uh, we'll find somebody. We'll let everybody know. But yeah, that's uh, we'll uh, see how it plays. It'll out, be a blast. Right? It'll be a blast. And, uh, and then, uh, depending, maybe uh, Brent will want to come by and hang with us next week. Brent was uh, busy today, as we forgot to mention at the beginning. But yeah. uh, we'll we'll be back here next on. Tuesday. Exactly. I, I, I don't know. All right, man. Good to Look see you guys. guys. Thanks, Thanks Gordy. Everybody. Yep. Peace and love. Bye. Thanks, Gordy. Bye, guys.